Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. This video will focus on the basics of bacterial structure and function. This video is part of our Introduction to Microbiology series. I'm going to explain to you several adaptations that bacteria have evolved to cause disease. Evolution is an important step in the life cycle of a microbe. The learning objectives are to describe key structural and functional features unique to bacteria, to explain how horizontal gene transfer relates to virulence and antimicrobial resistance, to explain how the bacterial cell wall is involved in identification and classification of bacteria and as a target for antibiotics, to understand the role of pathogen-associated molecular patterns in an infection, and to visualize the major groups of bacteria that cause disease in humans. Bacteria are the oldest and smallest life form if we look at a tree of life. They are the first life form to branch out from our most ancient common ancestor. This means that they arose over one and a half billion years ago, even before archaea, another type of prokaryote. And they arose before the simplest single-celled eukaryotic cells that we call protozoa began populating the Earth. It took animals another billion years to appear. Thus, bacteria have been evolving sophisticated strategies to survive, colonize, and infect us for much longer than we've existed. Bacteria are also the smallest living forms. They're about 10 times smaller than a single cell in our body, and they colonize almost every available niche, from our skin to all of our internal mucosal surfaces. In some ways, we are walking planets since about one trillion bacteria live on the surface of our skin alone. There are more bacteria living on our bodies than the number of cells that make our tissues. Many will accompany us from the day we are born to our deathbed. In fact, most interactions between our bodies and bacteria may be beneficial and don't result in disease. Bacteria living on us are much more diverse than the subset that cause disease. We call this the microbiome. In fact, we can't even culture a great number of them, and most of what we know comes from analyzing their genomes. We're learning that the bacteria living on our external and internal surfaces have important roles in our physiology. For example, in the intestine, they help us digest nutrients, produce vitamins, and even teach our immune system. By simply being there, they also protect us from pathogens that could take over or invade. In this course, we will speak mainly about the pathogenic bacteria, those that cause diseases in humans. Let's start with a very basic description of the structure of bacteria and then discuss some features that are more specifically involved in disease. Bacteria are relatively simple, small bags of cytosol surrounded by a membrane and other layers of a tough envelope. If we start from the inside, we will find the cytosol rich in macromolecules, including DNA, RNA, and proteins, but no internal membranes or organelles. There is no nucleus, but similar to eukaryotes, the genome is encoded by double-stranded DNA. Usually, there is a single circular chromosome that is tightly coiled to fit in a very tiny volume. In addition to the chromosome, some bacteria have extra chromosomal genetic elements called plasmids, which are smaller, usually circular molecules of DNA. Plasmids often carry genes that are not essential for general bacterial survival, but that can encode properties such as antibiotic resistance. Horizontal gene transfer is the exchange of genetic information between bacteria. This is different from inheritance, which is transfer of information from one generation to another. It is a way to quickly share genetic information even between bacteria of different families. In infectious diseases, this is particularly important because both pathogenic traits as well as antibiotic resistance can be transferred in this way, making evolution much faster. In this picture, we also highlighted the bacterial ribosomes, which are factories for protein production. Bacterial ribosomes are different enough from our eukaryotic ribosomes that they are good targets for antibiotics. Here's a short list of common antibiotics that affect each of the two subunits of the bacterial ribosomes and interfere with protein synthesis. All of these internal structures are packaged and held together by several layers called the envelope. 
So let's talk about each layer of the envelope. First is a simple lipid bilayer called the cell membrane. You can see it here in green. And it has a transmembrane protein in it, the purple structure. Surrounding the cell membrane is the cell wall made of peptidoglycan. The peptidoglycan cell wall is a structure unique to bacteria, so let's talk more about this structure. The peptidoglycan cell wall is a flexible but strong molecular mesh made of a single molecule. You can see the uh, image on the slide. It consists of parallel strands of repeating disaccharides, that means two sugars, and cross-linked to each other by short peptide chains. The wall is important for maintaining and determining the shape of the bacteria and protects the bacteria from osmotic pressure. It needs to be constantly modified and assembled to accommodate growth and division. So it's become a very important target for antibiotics called cell wall agents. Now the cell wall and the cell membrane together are called the cell envelope. One group of bacteria have a cell membrane surrounded by a thick cell wall, and a second group of bacteria evolved a second membrane or outer membrane that surrounds a thin cell wall. These two groups can be distinguished by a very common microbiological stain used in the clinic called the gram stain. The structure of the envelope determines the difference in the staining. And here is an example of the stain. Gram-positive bacteria have thick cell walls that stain strongly and retain the purplish stain, while gram-negative bacteria stain poorly and remain pink. The outer cell membrane of gram-negative bacteria is a barrier that allows further control of diffusion of substances in and out of the bacteria. This makes them naturally resistant to antibiotics that cannot penetrate that outer membrane. It also makes them resistant to enzymes that might degrade the cell wall, like lysozyme in our tears and saliva. There are many important modifications of the cell wall and the outer cell membrane that change the properties of the envelope. One that's very important in medicine is on the outer leaflet of the outer membrane, and it is LPS, or lipopolysaccharides. These are special lipids cross-linked to sugar chains called lipopolysaccharides. LPS is important for the structural integrity of the outer membrane and its permeability. It is also an extremely potent signaling molecule. When LPS is released from dying bacteria, it can be sensed by our innate immune system in the bloodstream. The response can be so dramatic that it acts like a toxin and causes shock and even death. In fact, it is also known as endotoxin, as opposed to toxins that are secreted by the bacteria, exotoxins. The response to LPS is an example of our body's ability to detect specific molecules from bacterial pathogens and even from commensals. We call these pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. All the structures that I just talked about are in all bacteria. There are other structures that are not in all bacteria. These optional structures of the bacterial envelope can be quite important in colonizing us or in causing disease. For example, many bacteria swim propelled by rotating flagella, which is a tubular polymer anchored to a nanomotor that spins the flagella. The envelope may be covered with other structures like fimbriae or pili. These are long polymers with a molecular hook at the end that allows the bacteria to attach to the cell surface or to each other. Several types of molecular syringes, known as secretion systems, may be embedded in the envelope. These can secrete or transfer molecules from the bacteria to the host cells. Finally, a very conspicuous external addition to the envelope is a mucoid substance made of sugars or polysaccharides called a capsule. It can help bacteria either avoid being seen by our immune systems by hiding their surface structures and prevent them from drying out, or make them really difficult to phagocytose by our white blood cells. There are many specialized molecules that are involved in disease and are usually not essential to the survival of the bacteria. We often call these bacterial products virulence factors because they enhance the ability of bacteria to cause disease. One example of a specific virulence factor is the protein that Vibrio cholera produces to induce massive watery diarrhea. 
This is called cholera toxin and is the red and green structure that you can see on the slide. It's an example of a virulence factor that can quickly lead a person to dehydration because of the action of a single molecule with a very powerful biological effect. Many virulence factors are shared through horizontal gene transfer, which I already mentioned. As we explore the many fascinating microbes that cause disease in humans, think about these adaptations and which virulence factors are involved in the diseases that you learn about. Here, I will end with a short list of the bacteria that cause disease in humans and will be discussed in our course. This list organizes the bacteria in a clinical way, which will help you place the microbes in context.